All right, everybody, this is interesting. Um, we have this paper right here, the World Scientist's Warning of a Climate Emergency, written by William A. Ripple, Christopher Wolf, Thomas Newsom, Phoebe Barnard, William Moomaw, and was, you know, signed by 11,258 scientists from 153 countries and it's great um, you know I always uh, encourage this kind of you know um, writing but let's see if it's any good uh, let's see if it's any good I'm not going to read the entire paper here um, all it does is basically show us what is happening what is going on uh, I'm not going to say anything about the the quality of the paper itself i mean i haven't really read it well enough to be able to um you know uh comment on it from a scientific perspective but here we they what they do is they make some uh some suggestions on energy pollutants nature food economy population and that's it basically and uh, let's see if it's any good. So we're going to do this together right now. So let's see what their, uh, their, their suggestions on energy are. And I'm going to read this up for you so we can find out together what it means. And I'm dying to find out what it means. So the world must quickly implement massive energy efficiency and conservation practices and must replace fossil fuels with low carbon renewables okay and other cleaner sources of energy if safe for people and the environment all right so that's figure s2 mm, doesn't say anything about you know i don't know where figure s2 is there's no there's a figure two in here and there's a figure one uh, okay so it's somewhere in some kind of a um, I think appendix or anything that's not in here in any case we should leave we should leave remaining stocks of fossil fuels in the ground and should carefully pursue effective negative emission using technology such as carbon extraction from the source and capture from the air, and especially by enhancing natural systems. Wealthier countries need to support poorer nations in transitioning away from fossil fuels. So far, so good. I, I, but here's the thing, I don't know what they say about nuclear because there's a figure as too and it's not included in this in this document. So perhaps figure as two says don't use nuclear, in which case obviously we would uh, disagree with them. So um, yeah, energy uh, quickly implement massive energy efficiency and conservation practices. Now, this is obviously one of the things that I disagree with vehemently. I've been uh, absolutely clear about this. Uh, this is something that is not going to work. If you look at the 1 billion people, the one and a half billion people who live in the West, they already use less energy combined than the non-OECD. So that's the six and a half billion people that are not living in the West. Now the trouble here is as follows, is that even if we would have our energy consumption per capita and they would add one third, which is the opposite of energy efficiency and conservation, by the way, um, we would end up having an exploding uh, energy demand situation. So that's not really going to fly. Um, whenever somebody says the world needs to implement energy efficiency and conservation, just remember this mantra, poor people have a right not to be poor. And there are so many poor people in the world 
that anything that closely resembles conservation or energy efficiency is basically not meant for them, just for the rich people. And the rich people already do not matter anymore. It's that simple. So next item is short-lived pollutants. Now let's see what they have to say about that. We need to promptly reduce the emissions of short-lived climate pollutants, including methane, figure 2b, also not included, black carbon, which is soot, and hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. Doing, doing this could slow climate feedback loops and potentially reduce the short-term warming trend by more than 50% over the next few decades while saving millions of lives and increasing crop yields due to reduced air pollution. And they reference Shindal et al. 2017. The 2016 Kigali Amendment to phase down HFCs is welcomed. So naturally, I am all aboard with, you know, reducing uh, methane emissions, reducing soot emissions, reducing the uh, you know the volume of HFCs being emitted but I'm 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 still you know I'm still not sure how they how they I mean soot yeah sure uh, cutting soot and black carbon is is obviously something that we need to remediate it's it's part in part uh, or it's a part of the indoor pollution problem but, you know, they don't mention anything like uh, sulfur or nitrogen compounds. Um, they don't mention anything about microparticulates, which is far wider than just soot. So, sure, we must reduce short-lived pollutants. I'm all for that. But please don't be vague. And the claim that we could uh, reduce the short-term warming trend by more than 50% over the next few decades, I don't know where that comes from. There's no reference for it, so I wonder how that claim is being substantiated. It's not in here in any case. Then we get the, then we get the rubric uh, nature, we must protect and restore the Earth's ecosystems, phytoplankton, coral reefs, forests, savannas, grasslands, wetlands, peatlands, soils, mangroves, and seagrasses contribute greatly to the sequestration of atmospheric, atmospheric CO2. This, this is correct. Um, marine and terrestrial plants, animals, and microorganisms play significant roles in carbon and nutrient cycling and storage. That's correct as well. And now we come to the nitty gritty. We need to quickly curtail habitat and biodiversity loss, protecting the remaining primary and intact forests, especially those with high carbon stores and other forests with the capacity to rapidly sequester carbon, which they call proforestation, while increasing, while increasing, that was some kind of a branch that fell down. Okay, um, let's see. While increasing reforestation and afforestation, where appropriate at enormous scales, although available land may be limiting in places, up to a third of emissions redu reductions needed by 2030 for the Paris Agreement, less than 2 degrees centigrade, could be obtained with these natural climate solutions. And they, they reference Griscom et al. 2017. So there's a reference for it. I have no idea whether that reference is correct or not. Um, at this moment, I have to assume that, it, that it's correct. Um, in any case, it sounds reasonable, but we also have to, you know, uh, take care not to walk into the big bear trap of thinking that afforestation is somehow a magic bullet. 
because in some cases all we are doing is creating is just temporarily storing the carbon because that's what forests do actually they temporarily store carbon that would otherwise be in the atmosphere but once a tree dies or once vegetation dies and it doesn't get submerged quickly enough it will turn into carbon dioxide and methane quite quickly again when it gets eaten by bacteria during the rotting phase so if you if you get if you if you submerge vegetation quickly like like what happens in peatlands essentially that's the first phase that you need for creating coal essentially and once you have coal it it, it you know it is sequestered not indefinitely but it is sequestered so that's better so let's see what they have to say about food and i'm i'm particularly skeptical about that eating mostly plant-based foods while reducing the global consumption of animal products especially ruminant livestock ripple at all 2014 can improve human health and significantly lower ghg emissions including methane in the short-lived pollutants step Moreover, this will free up croplands for growing much needed human plant food instead of livestock feed, while releasing some grazing land to support natural climate solutions, cropping practices such as minimum tillage that increase soil carbon are vitally important. We need to drastically reduce the enormous amount of food waste around the world. Now, I agree, eating less uh, meat and eating less dairy products uh, will free up land because, you know, we have to feed the cows and we have to feed the sheep and the goats and, you know, all those animals. And basically that food comes, their food comes from land, you know, and it it's basically, it reduces land use efficiency. So I'm, I'm, you know, I agree with this assertion. Uh, I don't know what minimum tillage means. Um, if somebody would like to say something about that in the comments, I don't suppose that it means, you know, being biological or something like that, because that would be counterproductive. But the thing that is missing here is basically industrialized farming or indoor farming or greenhouse farming uh, because those are proven methods of increasing um, increasing uh, productivity per acre significantly now there's two ways to do it you can have glass greenhouses but you also can have plastic greenhouses so in the Netherlands we have the glass greenhouses these are permanent you know, the only reason we would do away with them is if they get damaged by hailstorms, which doesn't happen very often. But if you look at, for instance, uh, the Almeria uh, area in Spain, they use plastic to cover their crops. So to build their greenhouses. And that's less uh, sustainable. There's also a, a, a region in Turkey near Antalya where they use the same system. So basically building plastic greenhouses in, instead of glass greenhouses and uh, increasing their, you know, food production in that way. So in the next rubric is economy. Excessive extraction of materials and over exploitation of ecosystems driven by economic growth must be great, must be quickly curtailed to maintain long term sustainability of the biosphere. Now, that's a point where I always take off my glasses because what do they mean here? Um, who is going to stop growing? Um, I'm not just talking about the West, Western economic growth, but I'm also talking about economic growth in countries like India, China, but also consider African countries, um, mainly countries in the tropics, really, uh, where the poverty is highest 
and um, you know the population growth is highest. So this means that they need economic growth to stop poverty. So I, I greatly disagree with this excessive extraction of materials and over exploitation of ecosystems. So excessive extraction of materials. The funny thing is, is directly contradictory to their claim that we must quickly Im quickly implement massive energy efficiency. No, wait a second. The so the uh, you know. So the curtailment of excessive extraction of materials is in direct contradiction with their um, aim to replace fossil fuels with low carbon renewables. So yes, it is true that if you stop extracting fossil fuels, that that might constitute stopping excessive extraction. But the thing is, here, they say the excessive extraction of materials, not of fuels. And if you look at how much materials are used for wind and solar generators, this is in contradiction to what they say. So you cannot have, you cannot stop extracting materials if you want to do a transition to renewables that's simply impossible so let's see let's continue we need a carbon free economy that explicitly addresses human dependence on the biosphere and policies that guide economic decisions accordingly our goals need to shift from gdp growth and the pursuit of affluence towards sustaining ecosystems and improving human well-being by prioritizing basic needs and reducing inequality. Now, as far as I'm concerned, these are all buzzwords. I, I totally agree that we need to stop uh, inequality and I totally agree that we need to prioritize basic needs and improving Im improve human well-being. But the whole thing doesn't work when you want to basically collapse our uh, the world economy, which is basically what they're trying to do. Or not, not necessarily collapse, but totally overhaul it. And the question is, I mean... Um, is affluence bad? And affluence, I mean, afflu being affluent in a sense of, you know, having having enough money to do whatever you want to do, and having the availability of services and and goods, and being able to eat whenever you want to eat, and being able to drink whenever you want to drink, and being healthy and such. To, I mean, it's just weird. Excessive extraction of materials and over exploitation of ecosystems, that's good. We need to curtail those. Driven by economic growth, must be quickly curtailed to maintain long term sustainability of the biosphere. Well, the thing is, they presume that one necessarily negates the other, as if this as if the biosphere cannot be sustainable if we maintain some kind of, uh, some form of economic growth for the poor. This is not true. But then they weasel in this, 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 uh, this stuff, you know, um, our goals need to shift from GDP growth and the pursuit of affluence towards sustaining ecosystems and improving human well-being by prioritizing basic needs and reducing inequality. Now, those are at odds with each other. Those are at odds with each other. What, what do they mean? What, what, is, what is improving human well-being by prioritizing basic needs and reducing inequality? I'm all for reducing inequality. That, that, that's my main focus. But why should we prioritize basic needs? I don't understand. Um, we should we should prioritize 
prosperity and well-being. I think that's that's that those should be the aims. Now, let's let's move on to the next rubric, population. This is the big one. Still increasing by roughly 80 million people per year or more than 200,000 per day. The world, let's see, I need to scroll up here. The world population must be stabilized and ideally gradually reduced within a framework that ensures a social integrity. There are proven and effective policies that strengthen human rights while lowering fertility rates and lessening the impacts of pollu and lessening the impacts of population growth on GHG emissions and biodiversity loss. These policies make family planning services available to all people, remove barriers to their access, and achieve full gender equity, including primary and secondary education as a global norm for all, especially girls and young women. Referenced Bongards and O'Neill 2018. Now this is this is a weird one. This is a very, very weird one. Um this is so wishy-washy, um, extremely wishy-washy. Um, sure, I mean, producing, you know, pushing for equity and 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 gender neutrality, basically, uh, making everybody making everybody equal, giving everybody primary and secondary education. I'm all for that. I mean, who wouldn't be? right um at least in the west and i have to be careful here because some might might consider me a social justice warrior but i i just believe that everybody should have the right to go to school regardless of your age regardless of your gender regardless of your sex regardless of your religion regardless of anything i believe that everybody has a right to be educated and to pursue happiness so the they are talking about policies that will reduce population growth and this is i don't believe it actually i don't believe that it's a policy thing i believe that it's the state of development that counts it's the state of you know, how well will you as a person be taken care of once your, uh, once your productive life is over, right? So what we see is that the countries where there is a higher availability of energy per GDP or per capita, sorry, I should say per capita, the fertility rate generally is lower. There's a, there's obviously a, a correlation between energy availability per capita and fertility rates. So in essence, that's all we should be pursuing right now. And naturally, I think that, you know, having more energy and having better education will automatically lead to lower fertility rates. What kind of policies do we need to implement? I mean, that's just superfluous at this moment. I don't believe that any we need to do any more than what we are what we are already doing. Um, um, it's it's you know I I've got a I've got a problem with people who try to you know make this an unbalanced discussion. Uh, you know, some kind of a uh women versus men thing and women need to be this and that and men need to be this and that um i'm just an equal opportunist for everybody and this is generally something that i don't want to partake in because it gets me in all sorts of trouble and uh yeah i'm all for you know equal opportunities for everyone and then they have their conclusions. Let's see what they what what they conclude. Mitigating and adapting to climate change while honoring the diversity of humans entails major transformations in the way our global society functions and interacts with natural ecosystems. 
Sure. I mean, yeah. Value nature more. Um, decouple from nature. Um, I, 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 I think that the eco-modernists actually have a good um, view on this. I mean, uh, think about mega cities, arcologies, you know, giant places that can house millions and millions of people in which all the stuff that we need to do to be a good society are converged, um, which greatly reduces the need for transportation and such. That that would be one of my ways to harmonize with with nature, basically balance it out better. That's not to say that we should leave, live in harmony with nature, but we should leave decoupled from nature. We don't depend on nature anymore. Sure, we can enjoy nature and nature will be there for all of us to behold. And, you know, but I don't necessarily think that, um, you know, we should be more dependent on it. We should be less dependent on it and we should be less taxing of nature. Let's continue. We are encouraged by a recent surge of concern Governmental, go governmental bodies are making climate change emergency declarations. School children are striking and eco-side law lawsuits are proceeding in the courts. Grassroots citizen movements are demanding change and many countries, states and provinces, cities and businesses are responding. The question is, are they responding in the correct way? If I look at the Netherlands, for instance, just to keep it, you know, uh, close to home, um, our response is far from effective. It's it's pretty useless, actually. Um, our response is basically, let's stop uh, nitrogen emissions, which basically uh, kiboshes the whole agricultural you know, excellence that we have. They say all the farmers are up in arms at this moment. And that's why, and that's despite us having the the most fertile grounds and, and, and the, you know, the highest efficiency in agricultural, you know, in, agri in agricultural uh, processes all, all over the, from, you know, compared to all over the world. Um, then it's cutting CO2 emissions so drastically that they say, okay, every car in the, in the country uh, needs to drop their maximum speed by like 30 kilometers an hour, which is one thing that they're um, trying to pursue again. Instead, I would say, let's make public transportation cheaper and let's make sure that new businesses build their businesses around uh, train stations instead of alongside the highway and the highway that would be my solution um they are now trying to build like 20 or 30 gigawatts or, or 20 or 30 gigawatts of wind uh on the sea um and and they say that this will be a cheaper solution for the people but in essence if you if you calculate it well enough you see that it's actually becoming more expensive for people they want to shut off all gas so just for reference sake in the Netherlands every practically 90% of all the homes are heated by gas boilers and we get our hot water from gas boilers and we also cook our meals using natural gas so we are all of our homes are attached to one giant gas distribution network and there are so many ways how you can basically maintain that gas distribution network without pumping methane through it what about synthesized gases for instance you know synthesized fuels um, I would pursue that if I were the Dutch. I mean, given the fact that we have sunk so much capital into this this distribution network, I, I don't understand why we would stop using gas. Why should everybody move towards electricity? And here's the thing. People say, well, electricity is much better and whatnot. 
But here's, here's the rub. For me, for instance, I have about 550 euros a month. My wife is a physical therapist. She doesn't earn a whole lot of money. And if we would have to transition from gas to electricity, it would cost us at least 10,000 euros. Now, I personally, I don't believe in loaning money. So I don't have, I almost have zero loans. The only loan I have is for my house. It's mortgage. That's the only loan I have. I buy my cars secondhand with cash. Uh, I bought this camera with cash. I buy my computer hardware with cash. Um, I don't loan money. So how am I supposed to come up with 10,000 euros to basically decarbonize my house or basically Im eliminate gas from my house? I don't know how. So I think this is this this. this this, I understand the movements, I understand why they're protesting and I understand why they want to push governments into a certain direction, but they fail to understand that pushing, pushing governments and pushing, you know, businesses does not necessarily mean that they will implement the best solutions. So let's continue. As the Alliance of World Scientists, we stand ready to assist decision makers in a just transition to a sustainable and equitable future. We urge widespread use of vital signs which will better allow policymakers, the private sector and the public to understand the magnitude of this crisis track progress and realign priorities for alleviating climate change the good news is that such transform the good news is that such transformative change with social and economic justice for all promises far greater human well-being than does business as usual we believe that the prospects will be greatest if decision makers and all of humanity promptly respond to this warming to this warning and declaration of climate emergency and act to sustain life on planet Earth, our only home. And the funny thing is I'm a writer, right? I published four books, and this would be something that I write in a book. This is not something that I would write in a scientific paper. For some reason, this got uh, published, you know, um, this got published. Oh, the, the funny thing is it's behind a paywall. It will cost you 36 euros if you want to read it. But I, op I opened it using Sci-Hop. So, yeah, I'm one of those people. I pirate whenever I can because I don't have enough money to pay for everything um it's too vague it's too vague um i don't think that they i don't think that they actually understand um they do understand the problem they have gotten the prognosis uh, they have gotten the diagnosis correct but i don't think that their prescription is good enough I think that it, this is wishy-washy stuff. Um, it's very cool that 11,000 scientists have uh, signed this declaration or whatever it is. It's a declaration. It's not really a scientific paper. Um, and I'm not, I'm not a fan of this thing. I, I do agree with a lot of the... the, the uh, I do agree with a lot of what is said here, but I also disagree with loads of stuff in here. And uh, I will not be championing this paper. I will be championing um, the eco-modernist uh, style, the eco-modernist philosophy. I think that's a much more positive outlook on the world, still acknowledging the, the pressing need to address climate change um, being much more effective at, you know, eliminating poverty, enacting the equity that everybody wants. 
and um, giving nature a chance to restore. Uh, but this seems to be, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it, it's too colored for my taste, what is happening here. It's too colored. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you all for watching. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.